aspect of God's nature is that God is holy which means that God in his goodness will never do anything that violates his holiness as we go through our daily lives in this world both our outer man and our inner person can get stains hate and anger jealousy and pride and lust and all kinds of things that, that that are filthiness of the inner man but he says I am the Lord your sanctifier I will work in your life to sanctify you which is to make you holy God says I will do that in your life greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to living strong today as always it's our joy to come your way spend this time with you in the word of God and uh, pray together with you over the last few weeks we've been talking about the holiness of God we've uh, covered a lot of ground from scripture, uh, talking about the fact that God is holy, He is thrice holy, uh, everything about Him is holy, and He wants His nature to be reproduced in us, and that's why we saw in scripture how God instructs His people, be holy, for I am holy. And as we talk about the practical side of that, uh, we want to really engage around how we as believers live holy lives. And so, 
Uh, in order to do that, in the studio today, we've got some great people with us uh, who are going to ask us questions uh, on the practical side of uh, living holy lives. And so we're going to do our best to interact around uh, those questions. We hope it'll be a, a, a blessing to you. So uh, let's take it away. Uh, your first question today. So, Pastor, I love fashion. I love styling myself. But sometimes I get these stares and these remarks from people about the way that I dress. But I'm not doing it intentionally. I'm just being myself. So how important really are the externals that we put on? You know, the clothes that we wear, the makeup, the jewelry, to be holy, not to be holy. Right, right. Yeah, Daisy, I think that's uh, a very practical and a question that, you know, I guess most ladies are bothered with. <laughs> and in some cases, maybe, you know, even as men, we kind of, you know, how much? of the external. How, how does God look at the externals uh, in relation to a holy life that he's called us to live? And uh, let me make these comments in response to that question. First of all, I think we are all very clear that God, first and foremost, he looks at the heart, right? So like, it's not that, you know, God is so impressed about, with our clothes and, 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 and the style and the fashion, whatever, you know. Uh, he's looking at the heart. We see that in scripture for Samuel, the 17th chapter. God is telling Samuel, you know, Samuel, don't look at the outward, uh, outward uh, expression there. For God does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart, right? You also know in Psalm 51, verse 6, David said, you desire truth in the inward part, right? God wants truth. He wants, you know, that integrity. He wants sincerity. He wants it in, on the inside, not just on the outside, right? He desires truth in the inward part. So that's the first thing that we are very clear about, that really God is looking at the heart. So holiness is really, first and foremost, a matter of the heart. It's not an external thing. It's, it's from your heart. And as long as our heart is clean before God, our, our heart is right before God, that's what matters. So we shouldn't, affect, we, we shouldn't let what people's perception on us dictate our relationship with God. You know, because some people look at you nicely. Some people look at you, you know, the same thing that you wear. Some people approve and some people disapprove. It's just a matter of perception of how things are. So long, as long as your heart is right before God. So that's one thing. But what else do we see in Scripture? What we do see in Scripture is while God wants um, the priority, the focus to be on the heart, He has said some things about the clothing. Right? And uh, I don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, but the two passages that I'm going to refer to actually have to, are speaking to ladies, to women. Right? First Peter chapter 3 Peter is writing, and he's actually talking to him, and he says, you know, uh, and I'm just paraphrasing here just for brevity's sake. He, he's telling them, you know, let it not be the outward adorning of how you, you know, plait your hair or, you know, do your hair and your outward the costumes and your makeup and all that. Let, let it not be the out, outward adorning, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is in the sight of God of great price. So, He's not saying don't wear jewelry or don't, you know, uh, be fashionable or whatever. What he is saying, what Peter is saying is, the emphasis that you give is the hidden man of the heart because that in the sight of God is of a great price. So he's telling us that, you know, also, you know, do what you want with the outside, but focus on the inside. In that same light, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, there Paul is saying, he's saying, look, women, when you, you know, whatever attire you wear, let it be, be as professing godliness. So now he is saying, the attire you wear should be an expression of godliness. So that's the instruction God is giving us, right? So while the emphasis is on the, on the inside, what you wear on the outside should be an expression of godliness. So that's kind of the, I would say, the, the guideline given to us in Scripture. Uh, that, that we, oh, the way we dress should be an expression of godliness. Now, again, uh, uh, when having said that, it's again, uh, people can define that or describe that in various ways. On one extreme, it can be, well, you only have to wear white. You, know? <laughs> you cannot wear any jewelry. So that's in some people's mind an expression of godliness. Well and good. If that's what it is for you, fine. But it, to bring that into context, I'll, I'll refer to Romans, the 14th chapter, where in Romans 14, Paul is writing about things like, you know, what food you eat. And he's talking about 
uh, observing one day versus another day. He says, you know, some people consider a certain day very holy. For other, for other people, all days are the same. You know, it doesn't matter. Some people like to eat certain kinds of food and some people don't like to eat certain kinds of food. So then in that passage, Romans 14, and I'll just make this, help point this out. What Paul essentially says is, who are you to judge another man's servant? In other words, you don't judge another person in what day of the week they observe or they, whether they observe or no, don't observe. You don't judge another person in what they eat and don't eat. He says, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. That means you make up your mind what, if you're going to observe a day or not, if you're going to eat this or not. The only guideline he says is don't do anything that causes a weaker brother. That means somebody who's new to the faith to stumble. That means don't do something that will weaken the faith of another believer. So that's the rule, uh, that guideline that God has given. So how do we put all this together? I know we started off talking about clothing and now we're talking about other things here. But the, the truth is the same. That is, focus on the heart. You wear whatever you want to wear, which is an expression of godliness. And don't judge others. Because as long as they feel that what they're wearing is their expression of godliness, fine. Because you may or may not agree with that. Right? You may or may not agree with that. Your perception may be different. Don't judge them because he is standing before God. Right? And uh, so don't judge what you don't understand. And that's where I would, you know, that's how I would respond to your question. Good, good question. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Any? So, Pastor, as I was growing up, anyone who did anything right was considered a holy Joe or a Jesus freak. And so sometimes I would tend to avoid doing those things which are right. So what would your advice be to young people who face the same kind of pressure? That's a good question, very practical one. You know, all of us, and I think even grown-ups and working professionals, I mean, uh, whether you're at school or college, especially there, you know, you have, there is the pressure to conform, to go along with the crowd. And if you pull out of something just because you know it's something that's not pleasing to God, immediately your label as, you know, whatever names people want to give you. And that could also affect people in the workplace, right? Your boss wants you to do something wrong. And you say, sorry, boss, I can't do this. And now you've got to take a stand. And then there's going to be repercussions to those stands. So how do we respond to that in our pursuing of living holy before God? How do we respond to this situation? The first thing I would say is God honors those who honor him, right? So uh, First Samuel, the, I think it's First Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, God is speaking to Samuel and saying, Samuel, be it far from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. So the first thing is, is always look for honor that comes from God, not the things that comes from man. You know? And Jesus taught us that. He says, you know, you seek the honor. In John 5, he tells the Pharisees, he says, you seek the honor that comes from God, and not the honor that comes from man. And in fact, in John 12, you know, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees. Or he, he, John, John makes this statement. He says, these people, the Pharisees, they believe, some of the Pharisees actually believed in Jesus, but they didn't want to come out and tell people about that because, he says, they love the praises of men more than the praises of God. So they're like undercover believers. You know? <laughs> they didn't want to acknowledge that, uh, you know, that, they wanted to, that they believed in Jesus. So here's the thing. You seek the honor that comes from God. For you and I, the applause of heaven is more important than the accolades of man. That's what we live for, the applause of heaven, right? So God, I'm going to honor you. Even if all my friends ridicule me, I know you put your seal of approval on me. That's what matters. So that's the first thing, you honor God. Second thing I would say in response to that is, you know, your testimony will leave a lasting impact on their lives. You know, I remember what happened to me in college. I was, I mean, I had a roommate going to college and, uh, you know, we were total opposites. I was this person who was trying to live a holy life. And he was like, he was a champion. He won the uh, cigarette smoking champion in college. <laughs> and he's my roommate, you know. And we are happy, good friends, but we are total extremes, you know. And, but we're good friends in college. And, you know, so we graduated and we went our separate ways. And I, re I remember about two years after we left college, I get a call from him one evening. And he says, Ashish, and this, these are the words he said. He said, Ashish, the life you lived still speaks to me. Right? So that is it, the power of your testimony. And Jesus, uh, you know, uh, let me say, Peter put it like this in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, you know, verses 11 and 12, he says, as uh, br brothers, as 
pilgrims and as strangers. Let us stay away from fleshly lusts which war against our soul. And he says, you know, holding up your testimony, even before those who ridicule you, and I'm paraphrasing this, knowing that on the day of visitation, you know, your testimony will speak to them. So that means on the day that God visits them, you know, whatever day, you know, maybe five years from now, maybe 10 years from now, they will have an encounter with God. On the day of their visitation, your testimony will speak to them. That's what Peter is highlighting. So that's the second thing I will say. You know, we stick with what we are going to do. We're going to live holy before God. We know our honor comes from God. And we know the testimony we, live, we leave behind will impact them. Some point in the future, it will make a difference in their lives. Good question. Yeah. Pastor, my question to you is that in my prayer life, I find it difficult to come before a holy God with guilt and un feeling of unworthiness. How do I deal with this self-condemnation? Right, right. I think that that's, a, that's a very important question. And I think it's something all of us as believers, you know, have had to work through at some point or the other in life and need to continue to maintain that, you know, because God is so holy. And, and, the, and the, the more revelation we get about the holiness of God, the more unworthy we tend to feel. I mean, like, I, who am I to approach uh, such a holy God? How does God want us to do that, right? What do we see in Scripture? So uh, the first thing, of course, is a basic thing we need to do is to, if there is sin, we confess that. We just keep the slate clean. Keep short accounts with God. You know, it's like, okay, don't go once a month to God and say, God, here's my list of all the wrong things I've done. <laughs> you know, can you you know, do my laundry today, you know, it's not like that. Keep short accounts with God. The moment you know you've done something wrong, take care of it. So God, I'm sorry. You know, that means I'm not even going with a sense of guilt and shame beyond, uh, uh, let's say, a second. You know, the moment I've done something wrong, go to God, settle it. I know the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed me from every sin. So set, keep short accounts with God. Secondly, uh, I, I would say, is that we must embrace this revelation or this truth uh, that we have been made righteous and have been accepted in the eyes of God. You know, that should be settled in our hearts, right? It's like what Paul says in Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. He's saying, having been justified freely by His grace, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we stand in this grace. So, he has made us righteous, we have peace with God, which means we are friends with God, and we are standing in this place of grace. That's got to be said. I am in a place of grace. I have been made right with God, and I have a good, I've been made, you know, I've, I'm at peace with God. That's, that's my standing as a believer. That will never change, even though I make a mistake. And that will not change. So I embrace that. Or like Paul puts it in Ephesians 1, of verse 4, he says, he has chosen us to be uh, in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in his eyes. So that's your standing. You are holy and blameless in his eyes. So that should be settled in your heart, right? And, and be, be, be embrace that. So first, keep short accounts with God. Embrace this truth. The third thing is this. Fight thoughts of condemnation, right? So the thoughts of condemnation, of guilt and shame will come. Sometimes they come from the enemy, right? Revelation 12 verse 10 says, he's the accuser of the brethren. So that's one of his job, accuse, like bring those accusations. That's part of his, his uh, arsenal against the believer. You know, put thoughts of condemnation, make you feel guilty. So that's one part of what he does. Sometimes uh, we tend to condemn ourselves. You know, if the devil doesn't do the job, we do the job for him. You know? So we tend to, you know, condemn, and we need to stop that, right? So resist, reject thoughts of condemnation, whether it comes from the devil or whether it's your own natural tendency. Some of us are more critical about ourselves than others. And so we tend to, you know, uh, condemn ourselves a whole lot. And uh, we need to stop that and embrace the truth. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now that's the way we're going to walk. There's no condemnation. God is not condemning me. So why should I condemn myself? And why should I accept the devil's condemnation? No, I stop that. So that's the third thing I would say. You know, we should stop these thoughts of condemnation by saying, no, I'm holy, beloved, accepted in the eyes of God. Very good, very good. I think we might have time for one quick question before we close. Anyone else? 
Pastor, what is the difference between being holy and being disciplined? If I read the Bible, if I pray and have my daily devotions, is that enough or is there more to it? All right, that's a good question, right? So in scripture, we see these three things. We see righteousness, holiness, and godly disciplines, right? And uh, while these are separate or distinct things, they are important in the Christian life, but we must not confuse them, right? Righteousness, that is a gift from God. It's not, doesn't come because I read my Bible today or because I prayed an hour today. No. Whether I read my Bible or not, if I'm a believer, I am righteous. I'm accepted and approved in his eyes. That's always a gift. And sometimes we confuse disciplines with righteousness. And that's a mistake. You know, we confuse that. No, we keep it separate. Righteousness is what God has given to you as a gift. Right? Now, holiness is our, that outworking of that righteousness. It's a process. It's a journey we are making. It's a growth process. That means we are growing from glory to glory. From we're becoming more and more like Christ. Now, to aid in that journey is where these spiritual disciplines come in. Right? So we have these disciplines. He has told us you know, that when we read the word of God, his word purifies our lives. When we spend time in his presence, then we become like unto him. Right? What's on him rubs off on us. So these godly disciplines of prayer, holiness, they help us in this journey of holiness. But the mistake we should avoid is wearing these disciplines as a badge of honor. You know, like, hey, today I read three chapters from the Bible. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm better than you. No, these are not, you know, stars that we pin on our clothing and walk around as though we are better than other people. No, the disciplines are things we do in order to grow in holiness. While the disciplines are important because they're, uh, they're part of this process, this journey, the disciplines but must never be confused with our standing before God or it must never be confused as us being better than other believers. In God's eyes, we're all equal. Yeah, we're all on level ground. So I can't say, God, I'm better than so-and-so and better than so-and-so because, you know, I'm doing so much more than this. No, it's only going to help me in my walk before God. So uh, disciplines are important, but we must keep them in the right perspective. And we must work on them. And God will give us the grace. Anyway, it's he who gives us the grace to pray. It is he who gives us the grace to understand his word. You know, it's nothing of our own. We only make ourselves available. All right, I think our time is up and we're going to uh, get ready to close the program. And I hope those of you watching us uh, enjoyed our, our time of interaction. We'd like to spend a few moments in prayer with you uh, before we go. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. Uh, we just pray for those who've been watching and listening to our interaction. We pray the truths we shared will bring them freedom, will bless their hearts and will empower them in their walk with you. Thank you for this time, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way. Hi there, we're just delighted to introduce to you our free church app. The main highlight of our church app is what we call the toolkit, which has eight powerful sections filled with the word of God for you. We have a section called gospel with tools to help you share the gospel with your friends. We give you videos. We have a section called Reasons, where we provide answers for commonly asked questions that you might encounter. When people ask you, how do you know that God exists? How do you know that God created everything? Why do you believe Jesus Christ is unique? And so on. Questions that you need, that you will face, and there are answers there. We have a section called Faith Builders, where we list scriptures on various areas of the Christian life to help build your faith and make your declaration and act on the Word of God. We have a section called Identity where we give you all the scriptures that you need to know to establish your personal identity of who you are in Christ. We firmly believe that who you are in Christ is who you really are. Uh, there's a section called On How To where we give you instructions or guidelines on how to do various aspects of ministry. How do you minister healing? How do you minister deliverance? How do you lead somebody into the baptism of the Holy Spirit and several other areas that you would encounter in ministry? We have a section called Group Study Guides where we give you several guides to be used in small groups to study the Word of God together on various topics and themes and this, this will keep on growing. We have a section called Principles where we give you the Word of God 
to help you uh, make right choices and decisions as you encounter various scenarios in everyday life. And then we have a section called Lifestyle, uh, where it tells you the, what the Bible says on various issues that you may face in life. And so this toolkit is something that's really important that you'll keep coming back using almost on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to the toolkit, we of course have all our sermons available to you, the audio, the video, the sermon notes, and the series. We have our TV programs available on the app so that you can watch it anywhere, on demand, anytime. We have our worship videos so that you can listen to uplifting worship music from our worship band. We have all our books available so you can read the books on your mobile device. And of course, we have the ability to connect to our services live from wherever you are in the world. So make sure you head out to the app or Google Play stores, search for All People's Church Bangalore, download the app right away. Enjoy the journey. I'm sure it's going to be a great blessing to you.